morning, guys. Um, before I start, actually, I got really emotional, and that was very moving, inspiring, and hopeful. So thank you for empowering us, and thank you. It's great that we had the opportunity to visit uh, places like Ashpeth and, and learn about the history. Um, but maybe you have already done it. If you haven't, maybe you, you could put the testimonies in a blog or something so people can read it, or maybe in the you know the positive stories that the British Youth Council does. So that would be very helpful for people to see and realize and be inspired. Um, it's hard to follow you guys, but I will try my best and keep it short. I will tell you about my book, The Lightless Sky. It's about uh, 110,000 words, 15 years of my life, and about a year journey that I took from Afghanistan to Britain at the age of 12 but I will do it in about 15 minutes or so. Uh, I was born in Afghanistan many years ago. Uh, spent much of my time as a child with my grandparents in the mountains of eastern Afghanistan as a shepherd. We had sheep and animals. It was, it was a great life. My father, I was born into a family where my father was a doctor and my uncles were businessmen. Uh, and we lived in a, in a remote district near, near mountains. So anyhow, after spending about three years as a shepherd in the, in the mountains, started school, it wasn't easy getting fitting in and having a normalized life in the village, in the district. Uh, before I got into my second year and then fit into school life, unfortunately the war started in Afghanistan, so the US invaded Afghanistan with uh, its allies, including Britain. Um, about 50 countries with 150,000 troops bombed Afghanistan. My home became a war zone, and uh, I remember going with my mother and the siblings and the children at the age of, like, you know, seven, eight, nine at the time, uh, trying to hide from bombs and rocket attacks in bunkers which was built for the Russians during the Russian invasion. Uh, and and the, when the Taliban government collapsed and their regime was over, overturned by the US and the Afghan militias, uh, and things wasn't getting worse, one of my uncle was a commander in the Taliban. Because of his involvement, life became very hard for us. And, and I mean, in the West, we have a very narrow understanding of things. So one of the reasons I wrote this book, which I hope you will get to read it, I mean, you can get it from Amazon, from uh, Waterstones, uh, to understand this, not only the stories of, as a refugee, but also the situation in Afghanistan is that, uh, yes, they were, they were extreme in their views. They, were, they punished people. They killed innocent people. That's true. They were cruel. But at the same time, they brought a sense of stability and injustice to Afghanistan, where over three million Afghans lost their lives during and after the Russian invasion in the 70s. So Afghanistan was a lawless country where every district, every village had its own warlords. There was not a centralized system in place, but the Taliban were students of Islamic studies. They came in and actually people welcomed them in the beginning because they brought a system, a uh, government in place, and they ruled almost 95% of Afghanistan uh, with an iron stick, but they provided, according to my family and my parents, it was, it was a good time of their lives that they saw uh, stability, security, although huge underdevelopment issues around human rights, women rights, uh, girls were not allowed to go to school, and all sorts of uh, other injustices uh, which, are, which are true. But at the same time, there's another perspective which you don't, really, don't hear about in the West. So anyhow, uh, things became so bad after a few years that sadly members of my family were killed or murdered by the US forces uh, because of our alleged involvement with the Taliban. The problem was because of my father's profession as a doctor, he had to treat everyone, you know, Taliban fighters, Afghan fighters, uh, uh, militias, police, and army. And because of that, we were between this hard place in Iraq where we couldn't win. Uh, and sadly, because of that, we got into, the, into a fight with the Americans. The, the issue we have in Afghanistan is that we have to kind of, I hope you would understand, is that we have cultural sensitivity and things like if, uh, if an invading or occupying force comes to your house and does respect your woman, then there's nothing else you could do but to, to fight. And even though not, 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 even though you know that you're not going to win this war against those people because they have you know, weapons, they have powers, but you still do that, do the things that you, you believe in, the, believe to be the right thing. Anyhow, as a child growing up in Afghanistan, you thought so much about revenge because there's a thing called Pashtun Wali, which we follow. And every mother will bring up their children uh, to take revenge, and the blood field goes on forever, which is really sad. There's a saying that if you take revenge after 100 years, you have done it too quickly. It's very unfortunate. But thankfully, my mother and my family understanding uh, of, uh, of Islam and, and religion and how violence wasn't the answer, and they wanted to change things. Because of that, they sent me and my brother away. Uh, I had a great relationship with my grandparents, and particularly my grandma, whom I loved dearly, sadly, a few months, a few years ago. Uh, she passed away. So one of the sacrifices of being a refugee is that you miss out 
occasion that only happens once in life, like my sister getting married, my brother got, got married, one of my little sister passed away. My grandma passing away was very, it really hit me. I mean, for a good few months, I struggled to put my life together. I just kind of lost hope in all sorts, all sorts of things because my grandma was so close to me that I used to go with her to people's houses. She was a midwife, although she was uneducated to give birth. So whenever I talk to school kids, I want to tell you as well is that, you know, our mothers carry us three, nine months in their stomachs and they go through so much pain to give us birth. Yes, we might have our differences. Yes, we might have you know, problems with our mothers, but trust me, mothers are the biggest blessing. I've not seen my mom for almost 10 years now. And I remember going with my grandma and seeing the experience, you know, sitting in the corner of the room and the pushing, the screaming. I don't want to become too philosophical, but uh, really we have to respect our parents and appreciate them, particularly our mothers. And sometimes I feel like how dare are we not to appreciate that, not to be grateful for what they've been through, you know, stayed awake many, many nights to, to raise us. So anyhow, I left Afghanistan with my brother. He was about a year or two older than me, uh, at the age of 12 in 2006. I didn't want you to leave, it wasn't my choice. It was the choice of my grandma and my, my mother and the rest of the family, because I didn't want us to join the Taliban to become fighters, to take revenge and, and fight so-called holy war. They didn't just, simply they didn't want to bury another of their loved one, which was perfectly understandable, but for us, if I had a choice, I would have certainly stayed and, and protected my family. So anyways, the journey took me, uh, to keep it short, took me about 12 months, went through 10 countries, started in Pakistan, went to Iran, Turkey. Uh, so, you know, cross borders illegally, even in trucks. I used every type of transport that you can think of. Stayed in trucks for during the day, walked during the night, uh, sometimes without food and water for days, if not weeks. And been treated really inhumanely been by the traffickers, agents, smugglers who I was in their hands and their mercy who my family paid them to, to get me to Europe. I had no idea where I was going, how long it would take me, when would I end up there. But the kindness and humanity of strangers saved me. I mean, there were people just smiling at me, a simple act of smile would help. And just people, you know, giving us food uh, and water and being, being generous, which was amazing. So anyway, I, the journey wasn't straightforward. It was back and forth after going, you know, staying in chicken coops, staying in places where you don't even keep animals. That's how bad the conditions were. I made it to Istanbul, a few months in Istanbul, then we were, I was taken in a, in a fit into the seals of the train to go to Bulgaria. Um, I never been on a train, this was my first time to be on the train, but then to, to be fit into the seals of the train didn't make sense. And then after about 10 hours of the journey, I was asked to jump from a moving train. I was like, this, is, this was in the contract, I'm not jumping. But then uh, the guy pushed me, and there was about other people who broke their hands and arms. Sadly, I managed to stay still, because being young, it been, I was very, my body was very small, so I managed to, to, to not hurt uh, myself seriously, and then ended up in prison, went to the hospital for a few hours a day, and then in prison before being deported back to Turkey in winter, in December of 2006, was snowed. So I saw the inhumanity and cruelty of the Bulgarian authorities, and I thought, how could this be Europe? How could, where's, where's human rights? Where's the principles of human dignity? And how, how could Bulgaria, how this, this could be happening in the European country? But the sad reality is that even now, Ten years later, after my journey, people are not only treated so badly in Bulgaria and other Eastern European countries, even in Poland, which is really sad, in Hungary, where those people have seen what it means to live in injustice, live in, in, in a cruel society, live in a place where there's oppressions. But those refugees are running away from Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, running away from wars and conflicts and oppressions. Um, it makes me greatly sad, in Bulgaria now, actually, they arrest refugees, Afghans, Syrians, and others on the border and send them back to Turkey, not only that they beat them, tortures them, and it's not done by the, not only done by the security forces, but it's done by individuals who are right-wing extremists, and actually the government supports them in things like, uh, unfortunately, a patriotic acts, but then for them to, to do so. Anyways, um, I made it, I was deported back after some time, I was arrested in Istanbul, sent back to Iran, and another long journey before making it back to Turkey, and you know, running away from a prison bus, and then this time I went to Greece through the Mediterranean and it took me uh, about 50 hours in a boat designed for 20 people. There were 120 of us in it. And when I see people drowning and dying in the Mediterranean, last year over 5,000 people lost their lives. And for me, it's not a statistic, it's not a number. It's, a, it's I don't want to get emotional, but it's really it's human beings, people with dreams and ambitions, with vision, with ideas. But unfortunately, they were born in a war zone. It's not their fault. I mean, I wrote in the book that it wasn't my fault that I wasn't born in Europe, I was born in Afghanistan. And it's, uh, we should appreciate the privileges that come with the citizenship. And I use an example, as a British citizen, citizen you are able to go to 175 countries without visa, or until recently. 
as an Afghan, my passport enables me to go to 25 countries that I haven't heard the name of. So there's a global injustices, uh, and it's really sad that people are not treated equally, but when you're born affects your life, and just an accident of birth, and I use this example again a lot, I have a refugee travel document which allows me to go to 15 EU countries, and every time I went to France last year, the year before I went to Calais, about six, seven times a year, and every time I went, the reason I was able to leave that miserable place, which I'll tell you a bit about it, was because I had this piece of paper. So everything comes down to how we treat people is everything comes down to the passport, the color of their passport. And it shouldn't be like this. I think we should treat people as people and with dignity and respect and compassion. Compassion is very important. I think, you know, when we look at history of the Holocaust, we say, how did they let it happen? Why did they let it happen? Actually, it, not the same thing, but things are happening in the world which we, we are, you know, when I say we, I mean the government, the states are responsible to act and respond. I mean, how could we let 4,000 people in 2015 drown, 5,000 people last year drown, because we just don't see it as, as people. We see people as a kind of second, third class human beings. And it's just like, it's about money, cost, fear of politics. It just, it makes me angry. That's why I do what I do in speaking to people. I mean, actually, yesterday I came back from Denmark. Uh, last night I arrived to Bolton. I live in Bolton uh, about 12.30 because I wanted to be here and to speak to you. Because I, find, I feel it's very important for us to be, able, to be uh, informed, to be aware, to be educated about those issues. So anyways, I managed to Greece after a few hours journey in the boat. And um, the boat was very small, overcrowded. We didn't have food and water for almost a week. And if things wasn't getting worse, the boat break down in the middle of the sea. And I, because the two things that helped me on the journey was faith and hope. And I had this conversation with God, you know. I don't mind dying, but not like this. Not now. Not here. Not in the middle of a, the Mediterranean. And the concern I had in my head was, my mother will never see my body. They will never know where I'm dead or alive. My family will hope and live that I will return back, but I will never return back. That was the thing bothering me the most. I thought if I die, we all die one day, this is the essence of life, but if I die in Afghanistan, I mean, if I die and I have a grave, my family can visit me, at least they would be satisfied that I'm not, uh, not here in this world. But, so it was greatly hurting me, and I prayed every prayer that I could, and we survived. And when we were, we were rescued by the Greece Coast Guards, and we arrived to a small island where people brought us food and water, a beautiful and very sweet act of generosity and kindness by the strangers. They heard that a refugee boat was rescued. It was, you know, humans, we are capable of doing good. In my, in my experience in the last nine, 10 years on this journey and in here is that majority of the people are nice. There are a small minority who are mean. I mean, I get a lot of abusive, hurtful, hateful messages on social media. Just a few people, but still, I mean, but the sad problem we have is the majority doesn't speak up. We don't stand in solidarity and I think, uh, we should do more of you know, campaigning and activism and advocacy and standing up for, for the rights of people who are who risk their lives to come here. So anyways, again, I made it to Greece. It was another legal battle. I was in prison for about 15 days. Prison was like a 12 months journey, 10 countries or so. It's like when you play Monopoly, you keep landing, go back to jail. That was my life. And uh, in Greece, after runaway, after I've been taken to a, a refugee camp from there, we ran away because we had to leave Greece within a month. And I forgot to tell you that when I started the journey, me and my brother were separated, although my mother saying to stay with each other and don't let it go each other's hand and don't come back no matter how bad it is. So I lost my brother and as soon as I started the journey, so I was looking for him and because of him, I, in Greece, I found out that he was heading to Britain. That's why I wanted to come to the UK. But the second point is that I wasn't welcome anywhere except Italy. So I made it to Italy in the back of a uh, very hot lorry engine. I was arrested there again. And then we spent about two weeks in a children's home in a place near Bari. Thankfully, I never imagined my book has been published in six languages in seven countries, including Italiano. And I'd love to go back and thank those people who were working in the children's home. They were amazing people. They were, I remember the lady's name, the people who worked there, but I forgot the place, the town's name, which was very near Bari in, in Italy. So I never thought things has happened since then. I never imagined. I mean, I just graduated from the University of Manchester, which I never thought would happen. I mean, anyway, so I want to keep it as short as, as I could. So uh, from Italy, I made it to France. I found my brother's friend. I, he helped me to get to France. Spent a very cool night in Paris. I went back nine years, eight years later. I had a very different welcome. I stayed in a telephone box in Paris. It was snowing. I was kicked out by the French police. Spent a very miserable month in Calais. It literally felt like three months. After about 100 attempts, I thankfully Luckily, made it to the UK. I was very pleased, relieved. I mean, Cali was a, a miserable place. It, hum it was humiliated the daily basis by the French authorities. By the place was cold. It was smelly, and even worse. When I went back after nine years, it was worse than what it was when I was there. I made it to the UK. I felt relieved. I felt a sense of freedom. I was very happy to be finally here. 
But it actually, this wasn't the end. This was the beginning of an end. This was another journey, another battle. It took me uh, two years to prove to the Home Office, to the Immigration and Local Authority Social Services that I was only 13. Because I looked older, because I was traumatized, and I've seen things that you no know, one can imagine growing up in a war zone and seeing people die in front of me. I saw killing and destruction, nothing else other than, other than terrible and horrible things. And then it took me five years to be, to be accepted as a refugee, to get my travel document, I should to get my travel document. In 2013, I was able to travel. So I, it took me actually two years to get into school. So I went to school in Bolton, a place called Easter Academy. Before that, I went to a place called Starting Point, which was a school for international arrivals. I was there for a year. I went to secondary school. I started in year nine for a month, and then actually started properly in year 10. Just in two, two years, despite English being my fifth language, I managed to get 10 GCCs or HCs. So the challenge is that you could do better. I'm sure we all have our obstacles and challenges and barriers in life. But if I could do, uh, if I can get 10 GCCs, you can do better actually. And if I can get HCs, you could get A's and A stars. So, you know, and this, this chance you only have once, and I think you should make the most of it. Um, other than that, I, after school, I went to college, did my A levels in politics, philosophy, and economics. Whilst I was doing all those things, I got involved. The reason I'm here is because I got involved with the, with the youth for a well, actually with the Bolton Youth Council. And then whilst I was at school, I was very involved in school life. I mean, the legacy that I left behind, I literally have every badge, every title, uh, prefect, ambassador, uh, representative, student leader, student council. I was like part of the school, con uh, the Bolton Youth Council, and the care children and care council. So I literally took you know, every opportunity because I wanted to give back to society, but also I felt I want to learn and experience, and, and I have this opportunity now to make the most of it. So I uh, go through the euphoria. Since in the last six, seven years, I've been part of 20, 30 different committees, commissions, and groups where I've acted as an ambassador, as a commissioner, trying to look into child poverty, youth unemployment, and all sorts of issues of social justice and causes that I'm passionate about and campaigned tirelessly. I mean, in the last six years, I have not remember wasting a day not doing something for others, because I'm so grateful for having been able to, to live in peace and live in security. So there are things that, I mean, bothers me, which is to do with uh, what's how, how we treat refugees and how we don't really welcome them. And I mean, when I first arrived to Britain, I did experience racism and discrimination when I was living in Kent. People would call me names and say, you know, go back to your country. And it's, it, sometimes it hurts. Little things was, was, was hurtful. And I think uh, that's why I feel like I have a moral duty and responsibility to share my story, to try to get people to think, even though they have a very negative experience, I want to make something positive out of it. And I think, yeah, since you know, graduating from University of Manchester just last year, which I never thought, imagined this, would, this could be possible. Uh, because with the help and guidance and support of people who believed in me, you know, social workers and youth workers and uh, teachers and others who said, you know, you can do it, it's possible, and I made it possible. And I think, finally, I just wanted to leave you with the thought that, uh, you know, I carried the Olympic torch in 2012, which was one of my biggest achievements. I went to spoke at the UN, I spoke at the EU Commission recently, I know I've been traveling the world, speaking, or uh, speaking, uh, and a EU council meeting in Malta, I'm going to the States next week. So I have these great opportunities because I, I mean, five years ago, I didn't even dream of being able to do those kind of things, but it's about having the right determination, being focused and staying dedicated and making sure that you take every chance and opportunity that comes your way or great opportunities and also appreciate and be grateful for what you have because there are 120 million children in the world who doesn't have access to education, let alone having the facilities and opportunities we have. Let's be grateful, let's appreciate that. And I end with a note, you know, what would you do if your home became a war zone? But also, what is the legacy that you want to leave, that we want to leave? I mean, look at what, was ha what has happened in the past and what's happening in the world. The world is a terrible place. It's very scary that people, huge division, fear, and hatred because of the difference that we have. And for me, uh, and there was, there's a saying we have in, in my language in Pashto that there is not enough time in this world for love. I wonder how people find time to hate. Thank you very much for listening.